It almost shames Christianity. It's, it's amazing to see the thousands upon thousands bear the cold. And uh, down the Cape it was cold. I don't know about up here, but it was cold. We were near water, and that wind was whipping off that water, and I threw my back out standing up there. And so um, we were standing for at least two to three hours. I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. Tonight we're not going to be going into hermeneutics, but we're going to share something that's been on my heart since this tragedy of Officer Gannon's death. Um, I didn't feel um, that I had the stamina to preach that and teach that tonight. And I really didn't study it, so I didn't want to just throw it out there, and I didn't want to cancel Bible study tonight. I don't think it's fair to you or to others that will be watching. But when I came home, I went right into bed. I, you, if you ever had a chill to the bone, where your bone is so cold, that's what I felt. And then getting out of that traffic was, uh, was something else. But um, I asked the Lord, I said, what do you want me to share? And, and he led me to the scripture in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. Proverbs 17, let me know when you get there. Hey, you're home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Everybody there? Okay. It says, he that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. He that justifieth the wicked. As Christians and those who are watching tonight, I ask you, please, pray for the judicial system in America. Not all, but many are corrupt, making back, back door, back room decisions. Many are unjust and are justifying the wicked. And if the just say anything about it, they're condemning us. Now, I know that the person that did this to Officer Gannon, and I don't know if many of you know what happened, but here's a man that simply went to work one day to serve a warrant to someone who deserved it. And him and his dog ended up getting shot. The dog lived, and he died. And the man that did this had 111 arrests, many felonies, that man should not have been out of prison. I know I'll probably get some flack from this from some of the uh, left-wing nuts, but I don't care. That man should have been locked up, and this would have never happened. But it's amazing to me how we justify the wicked. We make every excuse for them. 
even in the church. We make every excuse for them. Well, you know, that's their bringing up and that's their, you know, they just, it, it's not their fault. Yes, it is. It is their fault. Because they have a free will just like you and I have a free will that God has given to us. You may say, well, there's contributing factors to that. And that may be true. But how many times God has reached out to them and gave them a way out and they said no. He that justifies the wicked. And I want people to understand, I want people to look at this and see that God is not some big fluffy daddy up in heaven that just accepts everything. He's not. I've had discussions with people who said, does God get angry? Some people say, no, God doesn't get angry. Yes, he does. The, words, the Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. But it's a justified anger, and it's not an anger that's sinful. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. So you can be angry and not sin. And I'm angry. I'm angry that I had to stand in that cold for two hours for someone I didn't know but have a broken heart for. To see his wife now have to go alone made a vow to her husband. Of th he's 32 years old. Just starting, just starting off in life. I'm angry that his life was taken so, so quickly because of justifying the wicked. At first, yesterday, when we were standing there, we might have been there, might have been on the way on the bus. Imagine that we had nine police officers traveling in a, in a, a senior citizen bus. They were laughing at us as they were going by. Uh, I don't remember if it was on the bus or I was standing there. But I said, that guy that did this is a scumbag. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, I died for that scumbag. And that's true. And he should be given every opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. But that doesn't mean he escapes the penalty for what he's done. The thief on the cross received Jesus Christ, but he had to pay the price. He had to die. That was the death penalty. There's a big argument now in Facebook about whether the death penalty is right or not. It is right. The Bible says, he that liveth by the sword shall die by the sword. And I don't know of any sword that just goes through the air, flying through the air. <laughs> God uses men to bring justice. He that justifies the wicked and he that condemneth the just. I don't know if you realize it, but the wicked are getting more wicked. They're getting more daring, more bold, and do you know why? Yes, we're living in a time where the spirit of Antichrist is ruling and reigning and beginning to even pour out more and more and more and more and more. 
But the Bible says that the spirit of lawlessness is already in existence. The man of sin who is a man of lawlessness is coming. And lawlessness is preceding him at an apocalyptic speed. The wicked are getting more wicked. And the only way that they will have any hope is if you and I will get out of our shells and begin to take a stand for Jesus Christ. When you see injustice, to stand and say no whether they condemn us or not. But I believe this young man who did this, the system failed him by allowing him on the streets. He should have been incarcerated. But he's just one of many, 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 many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, that are in the prison system today. When I was young, and not proud to say this, my brother spent a lot of time in jail. And they used to be called correctional institutions. You were institutionalized for breaking the law, and they had an objective, and that objective was a correction. It was a correctional institute. It was to correct the behavior. Now it's just become a giant timeout place. People go and do their time and come out. And they're none the better. But yet let a preacher go on the corner of some of these torn down neighborhoods. These dilapidated areas that have been given over to gangs and Things and let them begin to preach, and then the first thing you know, it the police are there to arrest them. We've got it backwards. We need justice in the streets, not a vengeance, but a justice. A justice of those who will go and proclaim that. People can change, even the most vile. I once heard someone say something about Jeffrey Dahmer. Who remembers Jeffrey Dahmer? Eight people. He said he deserves and hope he's in hell. But he had an opportunity before he died to accept Christ, and he did. And as though people would say that is terrible. He should be in hell. That's where he belongs. Well, he needs to suffer like he caused others to suffer. I would say to them, that's why Jesus suffered, so that we wouldn't have to. But he's a murderer. So was Moses. And God was able to redeem Moses. The Apostle Paul was a murderer. God was able to redeem him. So my prayer is that this young man is going to spend the rest of his days in prison. And I pray that someone, some chaplain, A minister will go in there 
and tell them that even though you're in prison physically, you don't have to be in prison spiritually any longer. That there's one that can release you. And though you may have to pay the penalty the rest of your life behind those bars, you can still do good by reaching to the other inmates and showing them through your life that there is a God who forgives. And that's something that humanity doesn't want to hear right now. But he that justifies the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both, are an abomination to the Lord. Wow. Those people, mostly in the House of Representatives and Senate, that vote on the side of the wicked, and then turn around and tell us the just. And let me say this, we're not just because of our own righteousness, we're just because of Christ. It's imputed to us. And then to tell us that we have to accept what they call normal. We have to accept the abominations that God says they are, the sins. We have to accept that. And if we're not, then we're the ones that are the problem. But isn't that what they're asking us to do with them, what they won't do to us, that are of a difference? not of opinion, of what's right and what's wrong. This nation I'm almost afraid to say what I'm about to say. And I'm not talking about some flimsy repentance. I'm not talking about standing on the Capitol steps, making a big television appearance of religious actions that are nothing more than an abomination in God's nostrils. Making these gestures doesn't mean a thing to God. What means everything to God is if you do them, if you do what he says, if you listen to his voice. How many times you read that in Scripture? That he says, if you hear my voice and you obey me, then you will eat the good of the land. Well, what happens if we, do, we disobey his voice? We're not going to eat the good of the land. There's four states, I believe, right now that are battling fire. And it's destroyed over a quarter of a million acres already. Farmlands are being eaten up by corporations who have suddenly found that there's no more profit in it, so they're turning it into condominiums, the farmlands. How long do you think that's going to go before we fall into a place of famine? How long are we going to justify the wicked and condemn the just? Now, I love animals. I do. I love kitties. I'm a kitty person, but I'm a dog person, but Linda won't let me have one. But I see how they 
come out against that man that treated those two animals, those two dogs, starved them to death and beat them, and, and they come out all in fury and anger. And I say, where is your fury and anger about the unborn that I killed every single day in America? Where's your anger? Where's your protest? But an animal? An animal. But not a person? Because some quack defines it as a fetus? Some scientists say it's just a fetus. What does God say? I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. You, not it. I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. That's God's perspective. And yet if we stand up and say, abortion is wrong, it's killing an innocent baby, they condemn us. He that condemneth the just is an abomination to the Lord. When I tell you this, that judgment is coming to this nation if we do not repent. I'm not talking about just the Christians repenting. Maybe some Christians need to repent. But I'm talking about people of this nation that have taken this nation down the wrong road and they need to repent of that and return back to the foundation that this nation was founded on, and that's God. This country was not founded on Muslim or Buddhist or any occultic religion. This nation was founded on God, and I don't care how many professors in these universities and colleges that change the history books and make it say what it and make things say that they're not. I'm getting tired of it. I'm getting tired of having to be cowered into a corner and my mouth shut for fear that they may take something from me. Can I tell you something? Doing nothing has already taken things from you. Doing nothing. And I'm not talking about rising up with guns and knives and swords and revolt. No, I'm talking about returning back. Returning back to the things of God. Returning back from His Word. Not someone's opinion but his word. It's saying, God, we have sinned against you, and thee only have we sinned, and God, forgive us. Forgive us of our, of our, our idolatry. Forgive us for worshiping false gods. Forgive us for worshiping money. Forgive us for worshiping our jobs. Forgive us for whatever we've put in front of you that doesn't belong there. And yet we just shrug it off, put it off. Because we think we have another day. Officer Gannon thought he had another day. He would go to work that morning, put his shoes on, get dressed, go to the station, put his uniform on, put that badge on, strap on his gun and get his dog and go out for another day's work. Gave a kiss to his wife said, I'll see you tonight, honey. 
what are we having for dinner? And he never came home. That's the reality. We need to get away from this fancy fantasy that we think of in our hearts and in our minds in this world and say, God, what's the reality of what's happening? This nation, people are slipping through. Going to hell every single day because we won't open our mouths. Now, I understand you're at work. You can't do that. I understand that. But how you act, what you do, what you don't do, can speak louder than your words. The one thing, without one officer saying anything today, but all the newscasters are bl blasting it all over, they said when they looked at all of these officers, and can I tell you, I'm proud that I was there. I'm proud that God's, God somehow opened that door for me to be there. Because not everybody was in that line. But the one thing they said that all these officers had toward Officer Gannon was respect. was respect. Why do we have to have that at a funeral? But yet we got these idiots holding up signs. Black lives matter. Whoever said black lives don't matter. Of course they matter. But so do white, white lives matter? Hispanic lives matter? Portuguese lives matter? If you want to get ethnical about it, all ethics matter. But so do blue lives matter. Because you know what? They're people too just like you and I. The problem isn't black lives matter, this life matters, that life matters. The problem is this, a lack of respect for authority. And the reason why, it goes all the way back to the court systems. Because the court system doesn't respect the authority of the law enforcement officer and the law enforcement agencies, and they sit up on their thrones and they make these ungodly decisions to let these people go and let them go and let them go and let them go. We even have today a governor in California who has called for a sanctuary city, a, 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 a state, to house criminals. Do you understand that when you say that it's a sanctuary, it means it's a place of safety that you can come to? And so what happens is they commit these crimes and then they run to that state because they know they won't be persecuted. But the people in other states are being persecuted. How stupid. Where is common sense? I don't know if you heard a story about the lady that was uh, that took an Uber driver, took an Uber, and uh, he ended up crawling into the back seat, locking the doors, and raping her. He was from another nation. I forget where, Africa, I believe, somewhere. Okay. So he had a ten thousand dollar bail. Someone posted the bail for him. The court said to him. You can't leave the country, so you have 24 hours to turn in your passport. You know what he did? He left the country. And we have these kind of mentality of judges on the, on the bench that can't even use common sense to know that this man was from another nation and that his passport was... They should have said, no, you are not being released. You're not going on bail till we have your passport. 
he that justifies the wicked. Well, you pastor. Innocent till proven guilty. Yes, but now, guess what? We can't prove if he's innocent or guilty. Except by his actions, why did he flee? He that justifies the wicked. You and I are justifying the wicked every time we refuse to open our mouth. I'm not talking about being opinionated. I'm sick of opinions already. I want factual, biblical truth. When are the Christians going to stop playing church? Bouncing their little balls and breaking their little light sticks and waving them in services. When are they going to let their light shine before men that they may see the Father's good works? When are they going to when are they going to break the light sticks of their heart and repent of their sins so that the, the world can see a different person than the, what the world is? You understand what I'm saying? Church has become like the world now. We made it like a nightclub, made it comfortable for people to come in. No, no, you need to be different. A peculiar people. A holy nation. Different. Not the same. You don't use the world to attract somebody. You be different. Why did you forgive that person that spoke that to you? Why did you not get upset with that person? But you said you were going to pray for that person. Why did you do that? Because you're different. It all starts up here and in here. What you deem the most important to you is what you'll be committed to. Is this, a, is this ministry just a ministry where you just come and go as you please and there's no responsibility, accountability? Amen. Is this your church? Can I tell you this? And I, I mean this with all the sincerity of my heart. The day that people start treating this ministry as non, a non-factor in their life is the day I'll walk behind this pulpit and I'll give you my resignation and I'll walk away. If this ministry doesn't mean anything to you, but you just come and go as you please, no commitment, I will resign because I don't want to waste my time. I'm 62 years old. I don't have much time left. Because when I see a lack of commitment to your responsibilities here in this church, I see there's a lack of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello? He that justifies the wicked, he that condemns the just, are both an abomination. Disgusting. Do you have the message Bible? I got two heads shaking. Thank you. Bobblehead Wednesday. <laughs> Shoot that up there for me, brother. Whitewashing bad people.
Was it Jesus or was it Paul who said, you whitewashed sepulchers? You're whitewashed on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're dead. He said, whitewashing bad people and throwing mud on good people are equally abhorrent to God. People are having babies out of wedlock. We're cuddling them, and oh, what a cute little thing. Like, we're, 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 we're justifying them. No, do you understand? And, and please understand when I use this, I'll use a different word so you don't get upset with me. When a, when a baby's born out of wedlock, they have a curse on them of illegitimacy. Did you know that? Hello? And we wonder why our kids are like they are. Either this is true or it's not. Either God's way is the right way or it's not. He said, you get married and you have children. You don't have children, then get married. It's backwards. Now, I understand if you're not a Christian and things happen, that's different. But today there are Christians. Hello? And all you've got to do is go back and time it. From the time they got married until, you know, and just find out that, hey, you know what? They were pregnant before they got married. But what a cute baby. Yeah, he is a cute baby. But guess what? If you don't renounce that curse, that illegitimate curse, and there's a word for it, you know what it is. Why don't people understand that? See, we don't, the church don't believe in curses anymore. That you place yourself under a curse even when you don't tithe. What does the Bible say? I'm not telling you what, I th what I'm thinking. Read what the Bible says. It says that you're cursed with a curse. Why? Because you've stolen that which is holy and belongs to God. Hello? You wonder why everything's falling apart? We do the wrong things and then we want God to fix it. Well, God will fix it if you're repentant. But he's not going to fix it unless you repent. That means turn around, about face, and go in the opposite direction and stop doing it. <laughs> what you're doing Let me ask you a question. How many here work hard? Raise your hand. You work hard. You're, you're a hard worker. Okay. That's, that's, that's a blessing to be a hard worker. Yeah, Nelson, you're a hard worker. You are. Okay. Vicky's a hard worker, but every single hand that was raised here, you're hard workers. What would you think of a, of a judge if you came home one day and all of your belongings, all of the things that you own, all the precious memories that you have been given are suddenly emptied out and you go home to an empty house. And then they catch the guy that did it. And he goes before the judge and he says, well, judge, you know, I've, I've had a rough life. You know, it's, it's been really bad. You know, I, I, it's been really tough for me. And the judge says, oh, Okay. A little slap on the wrist. You know, we're going to give you 30 days in the house of correction, but we're going to suspend that, okay? And we're going to hope that you just go out and don't do it anymore. Now, all of your stuff's gone. You can't get it back. It's all sold. It's all gone. He took the money, and he probably gave it to somebody to hold on to him until whatever. Would you think that that, just, that judge is just? Would you say that you had justice? What about God? Do you think God is going to justify the wicked? Do you think he's going to say, oh, hey, I was just kidding, you know. Everybody, come on in. Heaven's for everyone. Just, just come on in. 
Come on down. You're the next contestant. Come on in. Everybody, just slide right in. But people think that way. They think that it's a universal gospel of universalism. How can a loving... I don't know if you heard this. This, 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 this really upset me. How could a loving, caring Father God crucify His Son? How could he do that? Those people are loony. And they're teaching people. Carlton Pearson is one of them. Used to be a man of God. Used to be a preacher on television, a preacher of righteousness, holiness, now doesn't believe in hell, doesn't believe in, that God would send anybody to hell and that everyone's going to be saved and it's uh, covered by God's grace and love. And it's a false gospel. My Bible says that there is another Jesus and there's another spirit. How many have received another Jesus and another spirit. I believe we need to cast out some of that okie-dokie spirit. That everything's fine spirit. That I'm okay spirit. Once saved, always saved spirit. Hello? Can I tell you, I don't care if this church has every seat filled. All I care about is making sure that I tell you the truth. And the rest of the story is up to you. I can't force you to do anything and I won't manipulate you or, or try to use psychoanalysis on you and try to out psych you to do something. I won't use psychology to get you to do something because I figured it this way. If the Holy Ghost can't get you to do something, I certainly can't get you to do something. Whitewashing bad people. It's okay. You know. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm not. I mean, let, let, me, let me clarify something. If someone came, if a couple came in here and they were new, weren't saved, and they gave their hearts to the Lord and they were saved and they went home and they committed fornication and they're living together. Okay? I'm not going to jump on, on top of them and say, hey, you can't do that. You got to let the Holy Spirit Begin to work on them. So how I pray as a pastor is, Lord, bring, bring conviction. Bring conviction to them. And through the word, maybe something will be said. Maybe a word will jump out to them and touch them. But after an amount of time, hear me now, when it can be six months, it can be a year, when the Holy Ghost tells me, go talk to them. Believe me, I will. And I'll say, what you're doing is not right. You need to get married. You're sinning. And you know what? Most of the time they'll tell you, you know what, Pastor? God's been dealing with us on that. We want to talk to you about going through counseling or maybe setting up a time when we can get married. Yay! But if they said no we don't see anything wrong with living together, then I would tell them, then please find another church.
Hello? Well, that's not very loving, Pastor. That's not very care. Yes, it is. It's very loving and care to all of you who may think that I'm okay with that and I'm not okay with that. Hello? I had a minister one time tell me, say to me, well, we were in a prayer meeting and we were talking about different issues and he said, I don't care if the homosexuals come into my church. They can sit there. It doesn't bother me. I said, what if they were there for five years? He said, that wouldn't bother me. Oh, you may have 200 in your church, but no thank you. Because if there's homosexuals and fornicators and gossipers and all the ones that the scripture mentions in your church, and they're still the same way day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, Guess what? They're not budging for nobody. They're not budging for the Holy Ghost. So do you want them there? Paul said if there was one that was having sexual relations with his stepmother. And he says, why have you not judged that? <gasps> oh, I said a bad word. Pray for your pastor. I said a bad word judge it's a bad word today Paul said don't you judge such a person he said you need to get together and judge that person and hand him over to Satan what that's what the Bible says Paul said hand him over to Satan that their flesh may be saved We, we don't like that kind of preaching. That's what the Bible said. Read your Bible. He said he turned him over to Satan. Well, now that's a loving, kind pastor. I'm not going to that church anymore. If you begin to put the hermeneutics that we're learning into reading the scriptures, you'll be amazed how far the church has wandered away from biblical foundation. Your eyes will begin to be open, and you go, woe is me. Understand, when God moves, it always begins with us. When there's an, you know, we have services, you know, and the presence of God is here, and, you know, the worship team's up here, and, you know, they're wobbling back and forth under the presence of God. You know, they're, they're just like, wow, God, your presence is so magnificent. But did it cause you to repent of things? Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord. Now, the Bible says no man can see God and live, so he had to be, it had to be a spiritual thing. And then what did he say? When I saw him, I ran up to him and put my arm around him and said, hey, Jesus, buddy, what's going on? What's happening? Like some of these preachers on television that are saying that they had a conversation with Jesus. You know, and Jesus was depressed. <laughs> they didn't have no, they didn't have no, that wasn't Jesus. Isaiah said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. I saw him and he was high and lifted up in his train. The glory filled the temple. He says, woe is me for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And, I, and he said this, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What was he saying? He wasn't just talking about their lips and their words. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He that justifies, that whitewashes the bad people, 
and throwing mud on good people are equally abhorrent to God. We need Jesus. We need a move of God. Can I tell you, there's no church program. There's no worship style. That's going to do it. There's no denomination affiliation that's going to do it. What's going to do it is a people whose hearts are hungering and thirsting for God. And saying, God, I want you. I don't want to be robotic in my service. I don't want everyday mundane churchianity. I want Christianity. I want to be committed to you, Lord, and, and I want to go where you want me to go, and I'll do what you want me to do, and I'll say what you want me to say. And no longer will I allow the, the winds of this world and the philosophy of this world to form me and shape me and cause me to be more like the world. Make me like those who whitewash bad people. How many times you've heard people say this, and some Christians too, oh, oh, well, they're, they're a good person. No, they're not. What does the Bible say? There's none good. No, not one. Hello. Because they'll trust in their goodness for their righteousness. But our righteousness is as a filthy rag. Do you know what that means? You know the connotation to that scripture? It has to do with minstrel. A woman's min minstrel. Righteousness that's filthy rag. That's our right, that's our own righteousness. That's why we needed someone's righteousness that was higher and greater than ours. Amen. We need to pray for this nation. We need to pray for those in authority. We need to respect those in authority. We need to pray for those in authority. Can we stand? Does this help anybody tonight? <sighs> no, we sing that song, I give myself away. And then we take ourselves back. <laughs> and then we sing that song, I give myself away. And then we take ourselves back give ourselves away. But we need to really say, God, here I am once and for all to let my life count for something. Let my life be a light to those in a dark place. There are those in our assembly that are going through some difficult times. And while I'm thinking of it, if we can just pray right now for Kathy, our friend, who works at the I call it the chicken restaurant because I can't pronounce the name. She's going in for an operation and 
Last time she was in surgery, she died twice, and they had to bring her back. She has some complications. Can we pray for her right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift Kathy up to you, to Ralph, Lord. Tomorrow, as she goes for the surgery, God, we pray that your hand, please, would guide those surgeons. Give her grace, Father. For some reason, her and her husband have gravitated to Linda and I. and They want to be our friends. Because I believe they see something different. We ask, Father, that she would come through this surgery. That, Lord we would be able to present you to her and, and her husband. And I'm believing, God, one day they'll be sitting in this assembly, worshiping you and praising you. It's not to make this church bigger, to make this ministry successful, to put another star in our collar. It's for your kingdom, God. It's for you. You said, whatever your hands to do, do all for the glory of God. And when we do things for you, like the video, like the audio, like cleaning the church, like being here and opening the doors and vacuuming and making sure chairs are straight, whatever we do, we do all for the glory of God giving someone a ride, going out of your way, using your gifts so that your gifts can bless others. Lord, thank you. Now, Lord, we pray tonight, Father, that you make a move. We're expecting it, Lord. We want you to move. We want you to move in our hearts and in our minds and in our homes, in our families and our children and our wives and our husbands and uncles and aunties and sisters and brothers and cousins. Lord, we want you to move. Let our light burn, Father, so that they may see our good works. The works that you have created in us, not our works. And that they may glorify you. Thank you for this night. Thank you, Father, for allowing me to share this word. I feel the burdens lifted. My heart is lighter. Now, Lord, as we go our separate ways, I pray, God, that you be with us and strengthen us and comfort us as we go out to live this Christian life before an ungodly world, a world that will persecute us and ridicule us and mock us. But God, that doesn't compare to one stripe on the back of Jesus. It says in your word that they counted themselves worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. We count it worthy, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Yes. Yes, I want to pray for Pastor Diamond's niece. Uh, you remember Judy and Dawn that came up with them a few years ago, and, and it's Judy and Dawn's daughter. She has, she's in um, the fifth stage of kidney failure, which is toward the end. And she needs dialysis, and she needs a kidney transplant. And she texted me, said she was desperate, mom, the mom did, and said she's desperate. She doesn't want to call me because she's so, so emotional. And she said, would you please pray because I know your church believes in miracles. So can we pray for her right now? What was her name, honey? I forget. Stacy. Father, we just lift Stacy up to you right now that needs desperately that kidney Father, we know that you can do a divine intervention and miracle for Stacy. 
Sometimes Stacy may not have the faith, but Lord, there were others in the Bible that took a man and carried his bed and cut a hole in the roof and lowered him down. And because of their faith, Lord Jesus, you healed him. God, we ask you, Father. Lord Jesus, we ask you to heal this sister, Stacy. Take all the signs of this kidney disease and out of her system, Father, in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name that is above kidney disease. We intercede for her right now, Father. We ask that you be moved with compassion. We thank you. We're believing, Lord, that it's done. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Did you want? Mary? Who? Would you come and pray for her? Come, come pray for her. Yeah. No, you. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we lift up our sister Mary to you tonight, God. Lord, we ask God for your comfort in her spirit, for your peace to be upon her, Lord. Oh, Father, we ask, Lord God, that you will heal her body from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, God. That you will, you will just minister to her, Lord. Comfort her, keep her, Lord. Heal her body right now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, we rebuke that, that spirit of infirmity. We plead the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the manifestation of your healing in her body. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else before we close? Yes. Why don't you see if you can get them in breaking the chains? Do you know what that is? That's what he needs. Not a secular place. He needs a Christian place. A place that will give him discipline, get him back in the word, get him back in the prayer. Father, we just pray for Darren right now. Father. Oh, God. It's hard for those to understand addiction. There's something deeply rooted in his heart and in his life and his spirit and his soul. Father, we pray that, God, that you'll lead him to a place, God, like breaking the chains that will get to the root of the problem and that he would be healed, delivered, set free from these demons that keep him in bondage. Father, we thank you and we praise you. I pray that he would go, Father, not for, not for a week, not for three days, not for two days. He has to give up everything again, the, the apartment, the job, everything. It's, Lord, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? We pray for him tonight, Lord, for your mercy and your grace upon him, Lord that, Lord, you would bring him to a place. And when he comes through this place, that he'd be totally restored. We thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer toward Darren. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Before we close, anyone else?